Uh, with us today is Yang Bakos, class of 1994. Great class. He was a classmate of mine, so <laughs> I'm, I'm very excited. Um, Yang is the program lead and senior instructor uh, with electrical engineering and computer science at Oregon State University of Cascades. Well, I guess um, my my the first thing I'll say, if you'd like any funny stories about uh, Mrs. Weiss, let me know because <laughs> kind of go way back. <laughs> yes, for you. We sat in these the, those same walls too, um, and I know a lot has changed in um, uh, around Dayton. I know a lot's changed in Carroll, and I know a lot has changed in the world. But uh, we're not we were in those seats, so maybe not those exact seats. Those look a little newer, but we were there. So uh, I don't know how many of these um, career discovery type talks you've seen, but. Um, I'd like to hear more about you, actually less about me, um, but I will stick to the agenda. So, uh, yes, I live, uh, in Bend. I can talk a little bit more about, um, my unconventional to today, but, um, I'm, I'm a professor of computer science and, um, I've been teaching in higher ed for over 15 years. So I've been teaching college for over 15 and I've been at a few different schools in Colorado and Texas. I didn't grow up as an actor. Think that I would be in uh, working as a professor this uh, soon, but um, I've also been a software engineer for um, almost 30 years and have worked with small startups um, across the country from Chicago to Dallas to Denver and now in Oregon. Uh, with small companies and even large companies, so uh, even Apple. So if you ever use the Apple I or you program in Swift, I, I may or may not have had something to do with that. And um, as of today, you know, my wife and I, we live in Bend, and um, I still do software. Con I'll show you some interesting, interesting uh, projects that you might find curious and uh, teaching, as well as building the graduate for graduate students right now who are getting their master's degree in artificial intelligence. So I design and teach courses in AI, which everybody's talking about these days, I guess. Uh, and uh, my wife and I, we also own a coffee shop up in Bend. So we're also kind of a small business owners as well. So if you're curious about entrepreneurship or starting your own business or travel or anything related to technology. I certainly have an opinion that I could share. <laughs> fun, fun fact. And I bet Mrs. Weiss doesn't know about this. Um, but I failed out of college. Uh, this phrase a lot. And I, I think it's an interesting idea. Oh, so, try different things. It's okay. If you fail, you know, you'll pick yourself up and you'll move I don't think so, because failure kind of hurts. Failure is not something that we necessarily want to do. I, and so I think is failing forward is healthy, but I also think that it, it doesn't do it. In other words, you know, failure does fade. I think failure fades. It can fail forward, but um, failure can set you back to strike fear in the hearts of anyone. But um, I certainly think it's okay to fail. What I thought was interesting in hindsight was especially growing up at and experiencing a great school like Carroll, and I'm not just saying excellent school. And um, especially in, in the 90s, I think that um, we were, were really blessed to have excellent, excellent teachers. Um, our high school education was really good. And I'm sure it's good today that were set forth is kind of like do really good in school uh go to college there was this kind of pathway and i think that's common throughout our our country if not the world but uh in other words when i went to college i had no idea what i wanted to do and so if i wanted to do that that may that feeling may not fade for many many decades um mine and even some days i wake up not knowing what i want to do but 
that you should have this picked out like, oh, I'm going to study this or I'm going to go be a doctor. Or I'm gonna... I think not knowing is really healthy um, and is a way to opening yourself up to more. When I went to school, I started as a music major and then I was an English major and then I was a economic. That's probably like five different majors not really knowing what I wanted to do. And I think that many of us are going to college right after high school. And maybe it's too soon. Like, it shouldn't be the first thing that we do after high school. Maybe it's better to take a year to just, uh, you know, uh, one of my first jobs or second jobs um, was working at just waiting tables uh, just down the street from the school, actually. And... Um, I think having been, ex having, if, if I were to have been ex to a little more of life, then maybe when I went to school, I wouldn't have been so long after, you know, you know, doing pretty well in school. By the time I got to my junior year, I started, I just didn't care about classes anymore. And this is the short story. I'm sure I could be, if this wasn't all of the juice, but, um, you know, the short story is kind of this way in college um, uh, happened to me and I started to not care kind of, and, and really started failing out of failing my classes. And that was really good in terms with recognizing that there are, we were talking about failure, you know, there are consequences to the things that we do. And I think it was that experience that, that helped me recognize because i think a lot of us are lucky you know we go to a pretty good school you know having to confront something tremendously negative that really failing and being kicked out of school basically being suspended for for bad grades is and that was healthy for me um so basically becoming burned out and a year away from school during which time i moved to downtown chicago Mine and uh, got a job. It's a great experience. Finished my degree and then left Chicago. So here I am, you know, a college failed out of school. And I, I tell this to my students, you know, I, I, I tell them, I don't worry about you. You'll probably be fine because you're much, much better students than I was. So I guess, you know, you may hear from about the different paths that they've taken. And uh, I don't I don't think that necessarily be concerned if conventional. Uh, my path was definitely not conventional. So more about what your interests are, but you know, when I went to school, I was trying to consolidate my interests in both the arts tech. And at the time, this is in the 90s, those two things were not seen as going together. So I ended up having to kind of figure out, I was trying to, an undergraduate student, trying to take courses in, in art, visual arts, painting, photography, and so on, as well as taking classes in the engineering school. So I was pursuing actually two degrees, a Bachelor of Arts and Science at the same time. And that was just too much. That was a challenge. So um, I think that there are majors that um, that don't fit or pathways quite fit exactly to what your interests are. But I encourage you to try to ignite your own the own the things that you you are and uh, pursue them. So anyway, I'm going to pause for a second because I have some cool photos. What's one question you have about computer science or AI? jobs or failing out of school or like how hard like how difficult is it to get into like computer science field is it like competitive at all or is it like is it pretty lax you the three of you have in this room have one of the significant advantages over most people in the world and that is of your youth so I would say that for any young person wanting to pursue whatever field it is, you know, there's, there's that corny phrase, like you can do and be whatever you want to be. And 
it really is true uh, to a degree. It really is true. So um, I would say it is straightforward. It is very straightforward to get into software engineering or AI or any field, really, um, especially if you try to explore that now. You don't have to be super serious about it now. I think you should explore it and see what you find interesting and cool. But uh, to get into the field, I think there are there are two main paths. Number one is learning on your own, which historically is the way most people got into computing. And then the second, actually there's three paths. The second path is to go to college, get a computer science degree or a software engineering degree, and then try to get a job. The third path is going to a code school. So there are code schools now that accept students right out of high school, train them up and um, help them get great, great jobs. In fact, in fact, there's one specific program I'll, I'll share. Um, there's a company called Shopify, called Shopify. And I'll actually put a link to the dev degree. So Shopify has a program called dev degree and they partner with universities and they will pay. So Shopify will pay for your college degree. So they'll pay for your tuition and they'll employ you. So you'll be working for Shopify and going to school and they'll pay for all that. Plus you get a salary. It's one of the best opportunities I think it, uh, on the planet. Um, Shopify, you or your parents have definitely used Shopify if you bought something online. They basically power a lot of the e-commerce backends that are out there. So, um, but I would seek to have fun. You know, you'll you'll want to learn. You the the more math that you know, the easier computer science will be. Or I'll, I'll say, you know, the 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 higher the ceiling will be for your opportunities. You know, if you don't know math, you can learn it later in life. But the more math you learn now, uh, the better off. Uh, the more opportunities you can have. Um, in other words, you can do more advanced things with better math skills. It's not mandatory though. Math and computer science are not, um, math isn't a requirement for computer science. Um, if you learn to code a little bit now, you don't have to master it and be a super nerd and Mr. S Mr. and Miss super hacker. But if you understand and experience a little bit of programming now, that helps. So a little bit of programming, a little bit of math, opens up a lot of doors for computer science. Let me show you maybe some, some cool stuff. So I live in, in this town, which is Bend, Oregon. It's in the middle, basically in the middle of Oregon. And it's, it's this really pretty town, it sits on the Deschutes River. And, you know, there's mountains and stuff. This is, re this is a real picture. I didn't take it, but it's a real picture. Um, so it's kind of like this. Central Oregon has a really cool mountain range and when we think of the Pacific Northwest, we often think of a lot of rain, but Bend is really quite sunny and uh, super pretty. So if you're into the outdoors or you're curious about later in life about um, being able to go hiking or rock climbing or kayaking or anything, or just hanging out, uh, Oregon's a really fantastic place. Um, this is just some stock photos from online, but that's that's the blue pool, you know, un, unadulterated photos there. There's a ski mountain 18 minutes away. So, you know, in fact, this isn't a pitch for OSU Cascades, which is the Oregon State University's campus in Bend, Oregon, where I live. But this ski mountain's 18, 18 minutes away from, from campus. Some days it's hard getting students to come to class, especially if it's a powder day. But um, yeah, it's super pretty out here. And so this is kind of like... If I wasn't working all the time, these are the things that I would do. <laughs> but um, these are these are some of the students. We have a really small campus. It's about 1,000 students here in Central Oregon. And we offer fields from computer science to energy systems engineering to sustainability to tourism and adventure leadership to business and accounting and so on to biology. Um, the program that we have in computer science is pretty cool. I mean, here's some of our students out grabbing a beer, out the food trucks. Um, our, our students are um, really, really 
uh, fantastic people. Um, so these are just a snapshot of some of the things happening outside of the classroom. This is uh, some, some interviews and career events that we've had with some companies visiting. Um, but one thing that we try to cultivate in our students, and I think this is maybe important for to think about for Jim, Bryce, and Leah, is, is about not just becoming someone who is capable in your field or finding some kind of work that you like or that has an impact, but trying to develop yourself to be a leader in that field. So we try to really cultivate a shared culture of leadership. Um, so it's it's our students who are giving presentations. It's our students who are giving talks and exploring things and um, working with younger students and mentoring and collaborating with each other. So all while having a pretty good time. So anyway, just sharing a couple photos of day-to-day uh, -day life. You know, when it comes to computation, there's, I think there's a lot of things, or actually any field, any field, you know, if you want to go into business or you want to go into the arts or you want to go into the health services field or social services or technology or engineering, there's an opportunity for you to point that career in a direction that you care about. So in other words, if you care about sustainability or you care about or you care about healthy communities, or you care about family, or you care about animals, or you care about bigger problems in the world, um, from, from war to racism to anything. Um, I think that there's room for you to take something that you're interested in terms of your career, business, arts, and so on, and point that in any direction you want. So in other words, for computation, you could do a lot of things. You could be in, you could be working in cybersecurity. You could be working in building apps. You could be working in building crazy, weird AI agents that talk to you. Or you can also direct software toward sustainability and making impact. So here's one system that myself and our students make. So we collaborate with our students together to build software systems. And here I'll just, so the, this is a system that simply tracks river restoration projects across the United States. Um, and it's actually really grown organically. Quite, it's, oh, wow, there's a lot of projects now. Um, so um, the National Forest Service, Department of Fish and Wildlife, let me find some with pictures here. Um, there are all kinds of river restoration projects. So there are over 300 of these now in the system. Um, so this has become a collaborative hub for uh, landowners, sustainability researchers, um, ecologists to track and share what they've done to um, restore riverscapes throughout the United States. Um, and I can talk more about how that works and why, but the trick is this, what you do is you build artificial beaver dams, you build fake beaver dams. And what it does is it attracts real beavers to those, um, those riverscapes and they they come in and they start to build real dams and it starts to break up the stream. It just uh, completely restores the ecology around uh, around a river that might have been diverted for irrigation or some other industrial purpose. So anyway, um, my point is that you know everything has an impact in the world. Some sometimes negative, sometimes positive. You know every device and that we use and every every. Uh, uh, Every Bitcoin that's mined takes up power and natural resources. So there, there's a way to take the power of computation and kind of point that toward things that you might care about. In my case, um, it's a lot about sustainability and ecology, especially in the Pacific Northwest. Um, but there are many examples of this, and it, it certainly doesn't have to be about sustainability. Like I said, I think, you know, if you're interested in making money, that's a fine approach to life. I think everyone should make their own choice. If you're interested in being a, you know, just being a creative, um, expressing yourself creatively and sharing that emotion and passion with others, whether that be in music or film or dance or whatever, also excellent. So, um, but remember, I think you don't have to figure that out. I didn't figure that out. And, and I think many adults might 
not intentionally, but kind of fool fool you into thinking that they've figured it out. Like your parents are still figuring out life. You know, we're all still figuring out life, both as individuals and and as a people. So, so you know, a typical day for me is I think I think um, I think teaching. I think teaching is a really fantastic job. I think it's a great job. And in fact, one of Marlon Carroll faculty, when I was a high school student, who inspired me to one day, I thought maybe one day I would love to be a teacher. Um, in fact, in fact, Mrs. White's dad was, was a big inspiration in becoming a teacher. And um, when I went to school, I didn't know what I was going to do. I, when I, when I failed out of school, I needed a job. And I found that I was pretty good at doing computer stuff. And because I just needed a job, I ended up working for a small, I found a job working for a small startup. In, and uh, actually when I was in school, I had to work, I had to work my way through school. Um, Cause I didn't get a lot of scholarships, didn't, uh, you know, my parents were not wealthy. So I had to work, work my way through school. And um, I started my own business just doing computer help for, for lawyers and people who were working at home, which back then was kind of rare. Um, and anyway, long story short is I just needed a job and that's how I got into computing. I was pretty good at it um, and uh, found that I could just get work doing that stuff. I actually quit. I think it's also cool to actually quit your job and do something totally, totally different. <clears throat> In other words, kind of throw, throw your successes away temporarily. And, um, I think that it, I think you, it's a good sign when you come, when you leave a field and come back to it, that, um, it really resounds with you that maybe it's a good fit. Um, I, I didn't intend to be a computer science professor. I didn't intend to be a business owner, but there's, I think, I think in our lives, we, we do get second chances. I think in the, in the spirit of failure, I think that it's okay because in, in most of the important things in life, I do think you get a second chance. I think multiple chances do come around. So, if, you know, if you blow, if you blow it, you make a mistake, you'll probably get another chance. Um, very rarely is there like, no, there, there, that was my one chance to become famous and you missed it. You'll probably have a second chance for the important stuff. But I will say that opportunities, I think that opportunities are what are scarce and really great opportunities don't come around. So for me, if I look back and I think of the one thing that helped me get to where I am today is I said yes to every opportunity. I said yes to every opportunity. Um, there's a second thing I think that's important, but one thing that helped me get to an interesting point where I'm, I'm able to teach and run a business and build software that's kind of cool is um, and enjoy the place where we live is uh, saying yes to many opportunities. Uh, there's a point where also saying no to a lot of things is also really important. Um, but when when you have a chance to go for something, just say yes, just do it. I know it sounds, sounds kind of corny, but say yes to every opportunity because those can be scarce. But also um, I've seen this trend uh, where a lot of people, it seems, believe that once you graduate high school and once you graduate with a degree, uh, you're done. Like you've learned everything that you need to learn. And now your job is to work and enjoy life or make money or do whatever it is that you're doing. And in other words, you know, you, you work to get a degree or a credential, some kind of training, and that's it. You're done. That is absolutely false. That is absolutely false. And it's, and it's, it can be really tragic. You know, they, you, you probably are, hear the phrase, oh, we, we want you to be a lifelong learner, a lifelong learner. You're always going to be learning. It's very, very true. So I just wanted to make sure that, um, you know, in addition to saying yes to every opportunity, if you 
continue to seek opportunities to learn. And that doesn't mean taking a class or getting a degree. It means like going to a workshop, maybe learning how to dance, learning a new hobby, learning a new skill, uh, learning how to work on a car, learning how to paint, learning how to write better, taking a class or doing something to educate yourself or to learn a new skill. I truly swear it's going to open up doors because you're going to meet people. And um, uh, I will say some of the biggest opportunities that came across to, that, that that came in my life were there because I went out to these workshops or these educational opportunities. And had I not pursued those educational opportunities and those ongoing, um, you know, things to enrich my own life and my own well-being and, and skills, I wouldn't have gotten those opportunities. So I think opportunities and getting out there and learning go hand in hand. We're looking at different colleges. How do we tell which one has like the best computer science program? Or like, how do we judge them? Because they all seem similar. That is a great question. Um, there are, I think there's two important things to think about. Number, Well, three, three important things to think about. Um, number one, you can go to the, well, number one is location. I, I really encourage you to think less about the ranking or the prestige of a school and think about location. Um, so for example, if you'd love, if you think that you might like living in Pennsylvania or California, um, or you end up with some grants or scholarships to go to a particular school in a place, um, I think place location should be most important because you're going to live there for a while and you want to, you want to enjoy that life. Um, but second, every computer science program tends to have a particular kind of focus. And well, actually, let me let me preface this with with the following. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It actually um, it doesn't matter which school you choose. I think what matters more is what each of us as individuals makes out of the place that we go to. So it doesn't matter if you were to go to UD versus somewhere in Cincinnati versus University of Colorado Boulder. It doesn't really matter um, in terms of the academics, in terms of the academics and the job opportunities that become available you will get whatever you put into it. Okay, so that said, every computer science program at different schools tends to have uh, breadth. So they will have what they call options or focus areas in cybersecurity, software engineering, game development, AI, and so on. So when you go to their websites, you'll wanna look at the degree and see if they have a certain focus area. So they, they will call them either tracks or focus areas or areas of focus. And then you, you might get a sense of what their specialization is, of what the specialization is. So there's gonna be one focus in the program. In other words, every computer science degree has a particular style. Some of them, some of them do more software engineering, others do more mathematics. So in other words, it could be more theoretical or it could be more hands-on. So I think the location of the school is the most important. Um, I think that at, in the end, it doesn't matter where you go, it's what you make out of it. But when you look at those degrees, look at their website, kind of see what their area of focus is. So for example, if Bryce is interested in cybersecurity and he looks at um, University of Springfield and he sees that their focus in cybersecurity isn't really visible on the website, then maybe you should look elsewhere, right? The last one is that I think is important is the students. Like, what are the students like? Cause you're gonna be hanging out with these people and learning from, the, from, from each other and working with each other as a student. So you kind of gotta wanna get a sense of what's the vibe of the student culture there. 
And to discover that, to discover that you can, you know, every, every university has a subreddit. And uh, I know that Reddit can be a wasteland of negativity sometimes, but um, you could post a question on there on the university subreddit and the computer science subreddit, or sometimes those, a lot of those programs have discord servers, right? And you can hop on their discord server and ask a question like, what's the student culture like? I want to focus on this. What do you think? And the students can give you the real scoop. Um, you said that like you worked at, like as like a software engineer. So like, how like was that job, and like was it like stressful, or like how did that work for you? That's a really great question. Um, thank you for asking. So the question is, you know, working as a software engineer is that stressful, or what's that like? Um, Working as a software engineer is an awesome job. I think it's great for people who want to be creative and for people who want to work with other people. And that sounds crazy because I don't know about you, but I always thought that, you know, if you see pictures or in the movies, it's like, oh, to be a software engineer, I'm going to be staring at this computer for 10 hours a day, working for a startup, super stressful. I'm just going to be doing this all day. And... How can that be fulfilling? Um, but that's not what software engineering is. Um, I think that it takes a lot. I, I think we get to use our whole brains. In other words, a well-rounded experience and very and and our creative, uh, both our creative and um, um, sort of design-based paths, if you will, um, when building software. And we also have to really, really work with people. You have to be a you have to be a pretty good listener, and you have to be able to be empathetic with people and to be able to interpret what they say and extract what they mean, which are often two different things. Um, but you're always collaborating with other people. You're always in a team working together, and you're having a lot of fun. You're solving creative problems. It's it's like being paid to solve puzzles. A lot of it is like being paid to solve puzzles. Um, and if you, you know, you don't like puzzles or getting paid, then, you know, software engineering doesn't have to be for you, but, um, that really is a, is a kind of a simple way of thinking about it. Um, you learn about different subject matter as well. Like you don't just, you learn a lot about code and tools and cool things. But you also learn about things in the world. So in other words, if you were going to work for Shopify, building uh, building e-commerce systems, for example, you're going to learn a lot about international regulation and taxation and privacy and security and human behavior um, and uh, psychology and visual design. So like that river restoration project I was telling you about. I am not a master ecologist and I don't, I don't know anything about rivers, but um, before this project, but being able to work on a system about riverscapes and river restoration and sustainability, I got the opportunity, opportunity to learn about that deeply. So you're always, you know, it's, it's kind of like, you're going to learn to code and build software plus something else. So you might learn about um, code and law or code and politics or code and economics or code and art. So highly collaborative, very creative. Um, it can be stressful at times, but for the most part, it's, um, I think most software engineers would say they have a pretty chill job. If someone was thinking about getting like a master's, is that worth it? And then what would be a benefit of that for PhD in computer science? Great question. Great question. Um, the question is, you know, what about getting a master's degree or PhD in computer science? And I think this is true for all fields. Um, according to the statistics, right? According to the statistics, people who attain bachelor's degrees end up having um, more opportunities and, and, and better income in life, statistically speaking, historically, I don't know 
how true that is today. Um, with a master's degree, statistically speaking, those folks will have more career opportunities and higher salaries. When you get to the PhD, you tend to have fewer career opportunities and a lower salary. And it's interesting, but uh, that we see that phenomena. You think that as you get a more advanced degree, you get more opportunities and more income. But so a PhD is excellent for people who want to work in research. So if you want to, um, if you want to be a professor and do research, get a PhD, because uh, that's what a PhD is for. It's training you to be a researcher. So if you really want to be on the bleeding edge of AI research, getting a PhD is the way to go. Getting a master's degree is uh, opens up a couple additional doors. First, it enables you to teach. Most of the universities only require a master's degree in order to teach. You won't be doing research, but you'll be you'll be teaching as a college professor. Um, it also you'll also find more of the advanced jobs like in AI, machine learning, um, cybersecurity, and so on. A lot of these jobs will ask that the applicant has a master's degree, not all the time. And all that said, I would say that you can be successful in, in a computing field with no degree, with no degree. Um, and I, I myself am a, am a fan of that. You know, you, college degrees, they're expensive, right? A university experience is expensive and it, it, needs, to, it needs to pencil out financially. Um, in software, we've always had a history of lots of people getting into the field without a formal credential. So you don't need it, but it is, it's kind of a pre-programmed pathway to that career. So getting a degree is a known pathway to a career. Sometimes you have to get a degree. Like if you want to be a lawyer, if you want to be a researcher, a scientist, if you want to be a doctor, if you want to be an accountant or an or a specific engineer, you have to have that degree. But in software engineering, computing fields, um, most employers don't require a degree, but a master's degree for, for two additional years will be probably worth it. Here's one more bonus. There are schools uh, you were asking about, uh, Bryce, you were asking about what kind of computer science programs you might look at. Some schools have what they call a four plus one master's degree. And what that means is that in your senior year as an undergraduate student, you start to take master's level courses so that you only take one more year of school after your undergrad and you have a master's degree. Usually it takes two. So instead of taking four years, going and getting a job and then getting your master's degree, which takes two years, if you want, you can stay at the school and complete a master's degree in five years. So that's very helpful for students who start accelerated, right? So if you go in with a lot of AP credits and in your undergrad, you kind of finish your undergrad degree early, then why not, why not go ahead and take one more year of, of classes and finish your master's degree? That's a very, uh, especially if you have scholarship funds and grant funds, that can be a very smart approach to getting a master's degree. Uh, what are like some projects that you've worked on and like, how did you like contribute to them? Oh, great question. Um, let me share my screen real quick here because I can show. So I've done, when, when I first got out of college, I worked for an engineering company um, and so many of the companies that I worked with, I worked with, uh, I've had a lot of jobs, uh, and I've worked for, I've built, I've built a lot of software that sits inside of a company. So things that you would never see. Um, I've worked for Rotary International, big global engineering company called Parsons Brinkerhoff and other, other companies, some stuff that you'll never see. Um, one of my 
uh, I'd say one of the first big systems that I built was, uh, I guess you guys have Comcast. You have Comcast for internet out there. Cox, AT&T. Okay. So when I, um, at, out of college, I moved to Denver, Colorado. And, uh, one of the first jobs I had was with AT&T broadband. So they were cable, cable internet. And, uh, I built their support system. So, you know, if you ever need technical support or your the internet goes down or whatever, you go to this website and you can chat with people and get documentation and support. I built a system like that. Um, so that's one example of a system I built. And that was with a small team of consultants. Um, but I've worked with a lot of startups as well, um, helping to build their initial products. And um, I can point, I can show you a few examples of those. Uh, for example, right now, one of my clients is a company, small company here in Bend that repairs outdoor equipment. So if you have a cool jacket or, or a backpack and you get a tear, um, you can take it to this company and they'll, they'll fix it for you. And they now do outdoor gear repair for Burton, all kinds of, you know, Patagonia, all these outdoor gear companies around the world. And they are repairing hundreds of pieces of equipment a day. So we built the software that helps them um, manage all of those repairs. So when you look at sustainability, for example, uh, we want to keep keep things out of landfills. You know, we want th people to repair things that they have rather than buy new stuff all the time. So building this system helps this company uh, repair more and more equipment, encouraging people to uh, get their stuff repaired rather than uh, than thrown away. Um, I also worked for big companies like Apple. Um, so if you ever worked on the, uh, if you ever have an iPad and you have the, like the Swift, uh, Swift Playgrounds app, um, the early, early versions of that um, I was involved in. Um, that would have been almost 10 years ago now. So it's, it's changed a lot now. Um, so we built iPad apps. There's a bunch more. Um, we've had, we've worked with the National Forest Service. So I don't know if you've seen, um, I don't know if you all got much of the wildfire smoke last last year, um, but um, we worked with the National Forest Service to build apps for helping um, firefighters communicate and figure out the initial, the equipment that they need on the initial attack or wildfire. Um, we built apps for the local uh, county fire and rescue, uh, basically a digital version of their manual when they're triaging an emergency situation. Um, there are more, there are more. So we build apps that sit inside of big businesses that help them just operate and ma manage their information. We've built uh, software for different startups We've built uh, software for um, National Forest Service, for wildland firefighting, river restoration, all kinds of stuff. You were mentioning multiple career fields in computer science, like AI and data analytics and computer science. What's the like basic differences between those? I think um, with software engineering, you're going to be learning how to how to software engineering is about building scalable systems, right? Ideally systems that have a good impact on a company or a, a community or the world. So it's about building software that is maintainable and that can grow and that solves a problem. So it's about really about how, how, how to code, but how to, how to really engineer a big, big and manage a big code base. Very creative work. When it comes to cybersecurity, that's about learning how to exploit systems and find vulnerabilities in system. It's what we call penetration testing or pen testing. By the way, if you want to learn about pen testing and, and cybersecurity, check out Hack the Box. It's called Hack the Box. Um, it's free to get started. There's all these really cool things you can get online and, and uh, go through these interactive exercises for hacking. Um, so cybersecurity is about preventing, is about protecting systems so that, uh, quote, bad guys can't get in. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so about securing systems. 
when it comes to what we call HCI, human computer interaction. So you'll see things like uh, UX or UI design, I'm going to put it in the chat, and um, HCI, which is uh, human, human computer interaction. That's about making computers easy to use. That's about making software easy to use. If you've ever used an app and you're like, this is so stupid. Why do they do it this way? Um, it's about building software that doesn't make people feel like that. Um, so there's a human factors approach. That's the intersection of psychology, visual design, and software. Um, security is about, uh, cybersecurity is about security, law, ethics, and computing. AI is really interesting. AI is about, it's a mix of things. It's a little bit of psychology, a little bit of history, a little bit of math and what we call algorithms and a little bit of software. Um, so with AI and machine learning, what you're doing is you're trying to teach, you're trying to build computers programs that can make predictions or that can act intelligently or make decisions. So for example, you might program the software in a robot, right? If you imagine a Roomba vacuum cleaner, that Roomba vacuum cleaner, it needs to make decisions. Does it turn right? Does it suck up some dirt? Does it spray the mop? Does it go forward? How does it make decisions that are rational? So that gets very philosophical. So there's philosophy, psychology, history, and math and computing. Um, it's also about teaching systems to make predictions. So when you learn, learn about data science or statistics and computing, that's about making predictions. Like predictions could be who's going to win the football game this weekend? What's the stock market going to be? Who's going to win this election? Um, what's the likelihood of, or even in a self-driving car, like what's the likelihood of another car turning left? And how should, you know, should, should the car that's, <laughs> that's being driven by a robot slow down. Um, so it's about making predictions. Um, there's other subfields too, you know, like uh, computer graphics. Uh, the whole field of computer graphics and game design is another one that's very popular. But um, computer graphics involves a lot of what we call linear algebra. Um, it's not that complicated of a math, but it's a certain kind of math and uh, what we call parallel programming. So if you hear about GPUs or graphics cards and how to program those to create really amazing graphics really fast, that's about linear algebra and um, parallel programming. There's other tangential fields like uh, IT fields, information technology as well. So networking, for example, computer networking is, is a big one. And that's about how do we, how do we connect computers together? How do, how do they send data over a wire? You know, if you think about it, it's pretty amazing. You click a button and electronic signals go from your laptop over the air to the Wi-Fi thing in the, in the, in the school, all the way to you know, India and back or all the way to some other country and all the way back in seconds. It's really amazing. So that's kind of networking. How do you move data reliably really fast? Very good. This is this is great, Yang. You, this has been so helpful. I at least I've learned a lot. So hopefully the students have too. Um, do you have any final? We have like one minute. Do you have any final questions or? You good? Thank you so much, Yang, for joining us today. Hey, Jim, Bryce, Leah, thanks for coming. It's really good to meet you. And if you ever have questions about any of that stuff, feel free to ask Ms. Whites and, um, um, or myself. And I'm happy to give you uh, more specific tips on anything related to computer science or uh, how, how to fail out of school and, yeah. um, and still survive. Great. Thank you so much, Yang. Cool. You're welcome. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. Thank you.